Hi, um, what's your name? Oh, how do you do? Uh, Bob Butler, Corporal, 2nd New Jersey Infantry. Pleased to meet you. You too. What's that? To understand the battles of Trenton and Princeton, it's important to understand who George Washington was first. He was born in Westmoreland County, Virginia on February 22, 1732 to a family of prosperous Virginia gentry on a large estate. He was an ambitious young man receiving an early education and first gaining public notice by commanding colonial forces in the French and Indian War. After 1769, Washington became a leader in Virginia's opposition to Great Britain's colonial policies. He served as a delegate to the First and Second Continental Congresses in 1774 and 1775, and his presence became a stabilizing force during the deliberations. He was chosen unanimously as the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Forces in June 1775. Washington possessed more experience than any other American-born officer at the time, and was admired and respected by almost all of the Patriots. Throughout the war, he never flagged, despite obstacles and discouragements thrown in his way. He certainly had his shortcomings as a military commander, but in the end, with foreign assistance from military experts in both France and Prussia, he proved to be the war leader that the young nation needed to stay together and win its independence from Britain. Washington was unanimously elected as the first president of the United States in 1789, and then re-elected in 1792. He died at his estate in Mount Vernon on December 14, 1799. Uh, what, what side are you on in the war? Excuse me? Well, I'm on the side of liberty, of course. Uh, when I said second New Jersey, that meant continental line. That means I'm one of New Jersey's finest soldiers. Maxwell's boys, eh? You heard of General Maxwell, haven't you? Yes, I have. Absolutely, eh? Uh, so, I am a patriot. Why are you fighting? Why? Well, it's high time. <laughs> Listen. I got nothing against kings per se, but this king, he's a vandal. What kind of king will tax his people without their say so? It was my right as an Englishman, you know. You have to get my consent before you tax me. Oh no, says this fat German George. He says, oh no, you'll pay your taxes and like it. Well, I won't pay my taxes and like it. And then, my aunt, Boston, Soldiers staying in her house without her consent. Filthy men, profane men, drunkards and thieves and, and scoundrels and some criminals as well. She had no say in that. A man's home is his castle. The Battle of Trenton was fought in the town it was named after on December 26, 1776. The Continental Army had been suffering several defeats in New York, so the American troops were forced to retreat into New Jersey. Morale was low, and many men had deserted, thinking the fight for independence was over. In an attempt to end the year on a positive note, Washington decided to take a courageous crossing across the Delaware River to ambush a Hessian camp in the town of Trenton. He developed a plan that would launch an attack on the town with a main assault force of 2,400 men, which would cross the river nine miles north of Trenton and attack at dawn in two separate groups with Generals Green and Sullivan. The Hessians had arrived on December 14th in Trenton to establish their winter camps. The general left in charge was General Johann Rall. When he heard rumors of an imminent American attack, he secretly asked British troops to establish a garrison at Maidenhead, which is now Lawrenceville. The British refused. On the night of the crossing, the troops were already behind schedule and the clouds overhead were growing thicker. It soon began to rain, then sleet, then snow, and the temperatures dropped as the Americans crossed the river in Durham boats. Several men fell overboard, but none died. At 4 o'clock a.m., the Americans began marching towards Trenton and split into two groups when they reached Birmingham. Some volunteers from the area joined the group as guides, but the ground was slippery and many men did not have boots, so they had to wear rags around their feet as they marched. Many of their feet bled, turning the snow from white to red. Two died. Throughout the whole march, Washington rode up and down the line, encouraging his men. When he was informed that the weather was wetting some of the men's gunpowder, he said, Tell General Sullivan to use the bayonet. I am resolved to take Trenton. At Trenton, Rawl had already believed that there was to be no American attack. Therefore, it was a surprise when the Americans quickly entered the town and forced the Hessians to retreat, and American artillery devastated the Hessians even further. The three regiments of the Hessian force began to organize for battle, but the Americans stood firm at the heads of the two main streets in the town and repulsed any attempts by the Hessians to advance. 
Other American troops blocked off the limits of the town to prevent any Hessians from escaping. The Hessians tried to reorganize one last breakout, but Washington broke their formation and Rawl was mortally wounded. Washington led his troops down to surround the Hessian troops and finally secured their surrender. The Hessians suffered casualties of 22 dead, 83 wounded, and 896 captured, compared to two dead and five injured on the American side. Although the Battle of Trenton was a small one, its effect was disproportionate. It gave the Continental Congress new confidence and resulted in a mass of reenlistments for the Continental Army. What's life like in the barracks? It's good here in the barracks. It's on the march where everything falls apart. Uh, the barracks, well, uh, while we're here, we've got a fine roof over our head. Got a hearth behind me, uh, windows. You know, you pay taxes for windows in England. Uh, eats is good. Mostly because the quartermaster knows where we's at. So at the worst of it, at the very worst, plenty of ship's biscuit. Five or six of these, you don't want nothing else. Uh, salted pork, salted beef, salted fish, uh, salted horse on occasion. Uh, rice, beans, fruits, vegetables in their season. Vinegar, soap, candles. Everything a man needs for his comfort and well-being. Uh, what's life like on the battlefield? It's frightening. My first few battles I ran, and uh, it ain't my first fight. I fought in the French War with Colonel Parker, and uh, I don't know. First couple of battles with General Washington in New York, I ran like a cat with my tail set on fire. But uh, it's smoke. It's it's screaming, it's, it's, the best you can do, the best you can do is just stand, just do your duty and stand. There's many a times I would have turned and run, but when you get, you know your mates, you feel their shoulder, boy, I might run if it was only for liberty, but no, I wouldn't run, leave me mates. Uh, little, af little afraid of the bayonet. Oh. I ain't good at it yet, none of us are. But this, the sausage eaters and the bloody backs are very good at the bayonet. Uh, you see them coming at you, either with a great huzzah or the Hessians, they don't say nothing. They come at you silent as a tube. They wish to stick this inside you, you know. And it's your duty to try to stick your bayonet inside them. Many a times it don't last that long. One side runs or the other. Battle's very frightening indeed, eh? What do you think it means to be an American? I don't know. I used to think that when I marched off with Colonel Parker at the French War, if anyone asked me, well, where are you from, Bob Butler? Well, I'd say, I'm a Jerseyman. I'm a Jerseyman. And that's the world to me. I don't like Pennsylvanians or Connecticutans or pff, New Yorkers. Pff, well, he hates New Yorkers. But as I marched and fought with men from other, other colonies, well, they're there wasn't that much difference between us. And we all started thinking, you know, perhaps we're a little more. Perhaps we're, we're not just Jerseyans or Yorkers. Maybe something bigger. Maybe we're Americans. Do you think American independence is feasible? I think so. It's the right of every man and every government to be independent, but it's a sort of right that you just don't get. It's an earned right. So if we beat the sausage eaters on the battlefield, with little help perhaps maybe from the French, we earned that right, yes. How can a little island like England rule a continent? It's not right. What is your vision for the new nation if it earns independence? It's just a place where I can go, I can be, back in Sandown, I could sit under my own tree and look out my farm and see my daughters raised to honorable womanhood and, and, and die a place where men are free. So what's your real name and how did you get this job? My real name is Robert Butera. 
and I got this job by the grace of God. And the fact that I've loved history all my life, every time I, I, I get my paycheck, I go, oh yeah, I get paid. It's a blessing. For me, as other people think about, you know, say the guy who loves golf, saying I'll be a professional golfer and I'll golf for a living. And for me, history has always been a dream for me. And just the fact that I can dress up funny and talk to people. If you had to pick, what would your favorite part of this job be? The kids, the children. You know how I was talking to you, you know, you're looking at me, and I'm looking at you, and you know I'm, I'm a jerk, and, and it's fine, <laughs> no, it's good. But you get third, fourth graders in here, and I'm telling the story about crossing the Delaware. The, it seems the most rewarding thing is you're looking at their faces, and, and you're thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, they believe me. Oh my gosh, they really think that I, and, they, and so, you know, it just, you just want to pour yourself into it because these kids are actually suspending. You know, it's hard for, for adults to suspend their disbelief, but these kids, you know, they come in here, all of a they're picking their nose or throwing stuff around, and they sit down and you start talking and you just see it. You just see, it's like they're almost falling asleep because you're, you know, and, and when you get them to that point where they're believing you, that it's the greatest feeling in the world, it really is. All right, and last question, just for fun. In your opinion, who was the worst and best president in United States history? The best had to be Abraham Lincoln, uh, because nobody took office amid a set of troubles like he did. Uh, the worst? The worst president. Oh, gee, I don't know the worst. The worst president, let me think. Millard Fillmore. <laughs> no. William Henry Harrison, because he was only president for like a month. Well, that makes no, sense. no. Well, I mean, well, a worse president, I would say, was ah ah. I'm thinking was James Buchanan, because of the mess that he let go by, uh, that fell on Abraham Lincoln's doorstep. I That's like what the our Civil teacher thinks. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I I thank you. This is fun.